Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mark Roy. I'm the president of the Parliamentary Society. I welcome you for today's lecture. I want to introduce to you the honored guest on my extreme right, uh, Ambassador Barish from Costa Rica, Mr. Robert Mueller, Assistant Secretary General for commemoration of the 40th anniversary of the United Nations, and of course, you all know our honored guest. Today, we are also celebrating the 22nd anniversary of the Parchamentaris Encyclical Letter, which was issued by Pope John XXIII on the 11th of April, 1963. Uh, so we have a, a double occasion to celebrate, not only of the Parchamentaris Encyclical, but also we have with us our honored guest, the world, the world teacher. You all know Mr. Krishnamurti, and I don't need any introduction for him. I, it is with great pleasure I present to you Mr. Krishnamurti. I'm supposed to talk on world peace beyond the 40th anniversary of the United Nations. Mankind, man, has lived on this earth over 50,000 years, and perhaps much longer or for a less duration. During all this long evolution, man has not found peace on earth. Parchment terrace has been preached long before Christianity by the ancient Hindus and the Buddhists. And during all this time, man has lived in conflict. Not only conflict with his neighbor, but with people of his own community, of his own society, with his own family. He has fought, struggled against man for the last 5,000 years and perhaps more historically. There have been wars, practically every year. And we are still at war. I believe there are 40 wars going on at the present time. And the religious hierarchy, not only the Catholics but the others, groups have talked about parchment terrace, peace on earth, goodwill among men. It had never come about to have peace on earth. And they've talked about peace in when you go die, you go to heaven and you have peace there. One wonders if one is at all serious why man kills another human being in the name of God, in the name of peace, in the name of some ideology, or for his country, whatever that may mean or for the king and the queen and all the rest of that business. Probably we all know this, that man has never lived on this earth, which is being slowly destroyed 
why the man cannot live at peace with another human being. Why there are separate nations, which is after all a glorified tribalism, and religions, whether it be Christianity, Hinduism, or Buddhism, they are also at war with each other. Nations are at war, groups are at war, ideologies, whether it is the Russian or the American or any other category of ideologies, they are all at war with each other, conflict. And after living on this earth, for so many centuries, why is it man cannot live peacefully on this marvellous earth? This question has been asked over and over again. An organisation like this has been formed round that. What is the future of this particular organization? After the fortieth year, beyond what lies? Time is a strange factor in life. Time is very important for all of us. And the future is what is present. Future is now. Because the present, which is also the past, modifying itself now, becomes the future. This has been the cycle of time, the path of time. And now, not beyond 40, after 40th year of this organization, but now, at the present time, if there is no radical change, fundamental mutation. The future is what is now, and that's been historically proved, and we can prove it in our daily lives, or with man and woman are in perpetual conflict. There will be no peace on this earth. One may talk about it endlessly, the Roman Catholic hierarchy talks about parchmentaries, <coughs> and they have been also responsible for appalling wars in the past, hundred years of war, torture, all kinds of horrible things they have done to man. These are all facts, actualities, not the speaker's <coughs> wish. And religions, including Islam, Hindus, Buddhists, and so on, they have had their own kind of war. And the future, beyond the 40th anniversary, is what is going on now. 
I wonder, one wonders if one realizes that. The present is not only the past, but also contains the future. Modifying the mod past, modifying itself constantly through the present and projecting the future. If we don't stop quarrels, struggles, antagonism, hate, now it will be like that tomorrow. And you can stretch out that tomorrow's for a thousand years. It will be still tomorrow. So it behoves us to ask ourselves whether we as human beings, single or a community, or in a family, whether we can live peacefully with each other. Organizations have not solved this problem. You can reorganize, but war still goes on. So organizations, whether it's world organization or a particular kind of organization to bring about peace, such organizations will never succeed because human beings, individually, collectively, nationally, are in conflict. Strong nations like America or Russia are at war with each other economically, ideologically and actually, not bloodshed yet. So peace cannot possibly exist on this earth if there are nationalities, which, as we've said, is a glorified tribalism. Nationalities give certain security. Man needs security. And he invests in nationalism or in a particular ideology or belief. Beliefs, ideologies, and so on have separated man. And organizations cannot possibly bring about peace between man and man because he wants, he believes in something. He believes in certain ideologies. He believes in God, and others don't. I wonder if one ever considered religions based on a book like the Quran or the Bible, become very bigoted, narrow, and fundamentalist. And religions like the Hindu and the Buddhist, there are many, many books, all considered sacred, real, straight from God's mouth. So they're not so bigoted. They tolerate, they absorb. So there's this conflict going on. Those who rely or put their faith in books and those who do not put their faith in any book. So the conflict between the book and those 
who accept multiple books. I wonder if one is aware of all this. And we're asking deeply if you are serious at all, whether you and I and those of us who are involved in organizations can live at peace with each other. Peace requires a great deal of intelligence, not just demonstrations against a particular form of war, against a nuclear or whatever the atom bomb and so on. Those are the products of minds, brains that have entrenched in nationalism, in some particular form of belief, ideology. Though, so they are supplying armaments, the, re, the powerful ones, whether it be Russia, America, or England, or France, armaments to the rest of the world. And they also talk about peace, supplying at the same time armaments. It's a vast, cynical world. And cynicism can never tolerate affection, care, love. I think we have lost that quality. The quality of compassion. <laughs> Not analyze what is compassion, which can be analyzed very easily. You cannot analyze love. Love is not within the limits of the brain, because the brain is the instrument of sensation, is the center of all reaction and action. And we try to find peace, love, within this limited area. which means thought is not love, because thought is based on experience, which is limited, and on knowledge, which is always limited, whether now or in the future. The knowledge is always limited, and having knowledge which is contained in the brain as memory, from that memory springs thought. This can be observed very simply and easily. If one examines oneself, if one looks at one's own activity of thought, experience, knowledge. You don't have to read any book or become a specialist to understand your own way of thinking, living. So thought is always limited, whether it's now or in the future. And we try to solve all our problems, both technological, religious, and personal, through the activity of thought. Surely thought is not love. Love is not sensation or pleasure. 
It is not the result of desire. It is something entirely different. To, uh, to come upon that love, which is compassion, which is its own intelligence, one has to understand oneself, what we are, not through analysis, but understanding our own sorrows, our own pleasures, our own beliefs. You want know, wherever you go, all over the world, mankind, human beings, suffer for various reasons. It might be petty or some very, very deep incident that has caused pain, sorrow. And every human being on this earth goes through that on a minor scale or on a, or a tremendous incident as death. And, ma and sorrow is shared by all mankind. It's not your sorrow or mine, it's mankind's sorrow, mankind's anxiety, pain, loneliness, despair, aggressiveness. So you and we are the rest of humanity. We are not separate human beings psychologically. You may be a woman, you may be a man, you may be tall, dark, short, and so on. But inwardly, psychologically, which is far more important, we are the rest of mankind. You are the rest of mankind. And so if you kill another, if you are in conflict with her, you are destroying yourself. You can observe this very, very carefully if you look at yourself without any distortion. So there can only be peace when mankind, when you and I have no conflict in ourselves. And you might say, if one achieves or comes to an end to all conflict within oneself, how will it affect the rest of mankind? This is a very, very old question. This is being put thousands of years before Christ, if he ever existed. And we have to ask within well, ourselves whether sorrow, pain, anxiety, and all that can ever end. If one applies, looks, observes with great attention as you look with considerable attention when you are combing your hair or shaving, with that quality of attention, heightened, you can observe yourself, all the nuances, subtleties. And the mirror is your relationship between human beings. In that mirror, you can see yourself exactly as you are. But most of us are frightened to see what we are. And so we gradually develop resistance, guilt and all the rest of that business. So we never ask for total freedom. 
not to do what you like, but to be free from choice. Where there are multiple choice, there are multiple confusions. So, can we live on this earth, parchmentalist, with a great understanding of mankind, which is to understand yourself so profoundly, not according to some psychologists, analysts. They too have to be analyzed. So we can, without turning to the professionals, as simple laymen, we can observe <coughs> our own idiosyncrasies, tendencies. Our brain, the speaker is not a specialist about brain matter. Our brain has been conditioned to war, to hate, to conflict. is conditioned through this long period of evolution. Whether that brain with its cells, which contain all the memories, whether that brain can free itself from its own conditioning. You know, it's very simple to, to answer such a question. If you have been going north all the year, days of your life, as humanity has been going in a particular direction, which is conflict, <coughs> and somebody comes along and says, that leads nowhere, and he's serious, and perhaps you are serious, that he says, go south, go east, any other direction but that. And when you actually move away from that direction, there is a mutation in the very brain cells themselves, because you have broken the pattern. And that pattern must be broken now, not forty years or hundred years later. And can human beings have the vitality the energy to transform themselves into civilized human beings, not killing each other. Oh, yes, sir, ask any questions. Delighted. Um, Mr. Krishnamurti, we will have some time for questions, and uh, Mr. Krishnamurti has uh, kindly agreed to uh, answer any questions you may ask. When you ask a question, please raise your hand so that uh, the sound will be connected. Thank you. I, I'm asking a question in regards to, uh, to wanting a spiritual expression that I feel uh, linked up with. Am I being heard? I don't think so. I don't yes. Um, I, I feel that it is a disconnecting... Okay. I feel there's a disconnecting uh, sense that is being communicated to me. Um, I, I would look forward to a spiritual connection to myself and the fellow uh, people in this, in this group that would be an elevating sense. Um, I, I, 
that is what I would look forward to uh, experiencing at this lecture a more uplifting spiritual sense of oneness rather than uh, an intellectual expression. First of all, I don't understand the word spiritual. Is it emotional, romantic, ideological, or something vague in the air? Or facing actuality, what is going on now, both in ourselves and in the world? Because you are the world, you're not separate from the world. We have created this society. And we are that society. And whatever experiences one has, so called religious and spiritual, one must doubt those very experiences. One must question, be skeptical. I wonder if you realize. that the word scepticism, questioning, inquiring, is not advocated in the Christian world. Whereas in Buddhism and Hinduism, that's one of the essential things. You must question everything till you discover or come upon that truth which is not yours or any other's. It, it is truth. And it's, this inquiry is not intellectual. Intellectual is only a part of the whole human structure. One must look at the world and oneself as a holistic being. And truth is not something to be experienced. If, I'm, if one may point out, who is the experiencer apart from experience? Is not the experiencer part of the experience? Otherwise you wouldn't know what experiences had. So the experiencer is the experience. The thinker is the thought. The observer, in its psychological sense, is the observed. There is no difference. And where there is difference, the separation, there comes conflict. With the end of conflict, there is freedom. And only then truth can come into being. All this is not intellectual, for God's sake. This is something that one lives, finds out. lay a great deal of stress on inquiry and skepticism. I wonder if you could uh, tell me if faith plays a role in there too. You have mentioned skepticism and inquiry, and I wonder if the word faith also plays a role in your uh, exercises. What is faith? <clears throat> what do you put your faith in?
you one has faith in some experience one has faith in some belief or in a symbol and so on why does one have faith is it out of fear out of uncertainty out of sense of insecurity when you have faith for instance as a hindu in some symbol and you hold on to that faith or to that symbol then you are at war with the rest of the world but to enquire gently hesitantly questioning asking yourself then out of that comes clarity and you did there must be clarity to understand that which is eternal um in at the end you uh you said that we need to break the pattern of of conflict in in man between man my question to you is do you see that as something as an evolutionary process that will inevitably inevitably happen or do you see it as something that we all have to uh work very hard to achieve and uh there's an expression that goes something like this um in times of darkness the eye begins to see and uh what why I'm throwing that at you is because in a sense either it's going to happen or it's not going to happen but how do you see it happening i don't quite understand your question sir <laughs> all right you talk about um about uh breaking the pattern man has a pattern yes, the brain has a pattern yes. and that pattern has to be broken in order for there to be peace in the world of course all right now do you see that that pattern the breaking of that pattern pattern being an active movement or a natural progression in the evolution of man so have we evolved at all i think we're continuously evolving so you you accept evolution psychological evolution we're not talking about biological or technical evolution psychological revolution after million years or 50000 years have we changed deeply aren't we very primitive barbarous so i'm asking if you will consider whether psychological whether there is psychological revolu- evolution at all i question it and i don't really know. i don't personally to the speaker there is no psychological revolution evolution there is only the ending of sorrow of pain anxiety loneliness despair and all that man has lived with it for million years and if we rely on time which is thought time and thought go together if we rely on evolution then another thousand years or more and will still be barbarous will you please identify your name and organization before asking your question yeah yes my name is diane shaneberg i'm not with any organization my question is what would have to happen for there to begin to be psychological evolution as the speaker understands it 
Je n'ai pas compris, mais là, I mean, sorry. Psychological. Will you please repeat your question? Yes. What will have to happen within man's mind for there to begin to be psychological evolution as the speaker understands it? What about psychological evolution? I don't quite understand the question. You have said that you do not think there is, has been psychological evolution. My question is, what can happen so that there will be, so that there can be, psychological evolution? Huh? Madame was, I mean, I'm afraid we haven't understood each other. We have lived on this earth from the historical as well as ancient inquiry on this earth for 50,000 years or more or less. And during that long period of evolution, psychologically, inwardly, subjectively, we have remained more or less barbarous, hating each other, killing each other. And time meal is not going to solve that problem, which is evolution. And is it possible, we are asking, for each human being who is the rest of the world, whether that psychological movement can stop and see something afresh. Yes. Yeah, my name is Marcel Baal. Is it okay? Yes. Yes. Speaking. Oh. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask uh, uh, you what, it's the same question phrased in a different way. Uh, what should we do in order to, to affect this resistance toward evolution? I just want to say one more thing. There was a Dr. Bowen last month, and he said the same thing what you are saying in a different, in a different way. He's a scientist, and he was explaining the same problem. I wonder what do you think we could do, as a matter of fact, what, what could we do right now in what order I to saw. affect it? I've got it. <laughs> what could you do right now? Right? Yes, Change completely. <laughs> Both psychologically and outwardly. First, the psychological revolution. Not evolution, but revolution. Change completely. That is the real action of humankind, not trying to fiddle around in, in the periphery. Yes. <clears throat> Roshan Bilamoria with the NGO community. You stated that an important condition for understanding humankind is beginning to understand ourselves clearly. Do you see that in these rooms, within the next 40 years at the United Nations, that this understanding of humankind through understanding ourselves will become a part of global decision-making? I couldn't answer that question because I don't belong to the organization. Ask the bosses. Well, my name is Harry Lanner, and I'm the UN representative for the World Citizens Assembly and co-chair of the Communications Coordination Committee for the UN. And I'd like to uh, uh, 
for the record state that Mr. Marcel Bo, who asked that very significant question before, is also a member of that group. And I trust that you and he will have a chance to talk a bit later because many of his writings seem to be, uh, well, uh, highly related to your conclusions. But I would like to add another note, perhaps a note of greater encouragement in my, in my question. <coughs> you indicated that organizations may not provide the answer, and you also indicated that the history of humanity would uh, incline you to pessimism about the uh, future or salvation. Uh, <coughs> and I think it depends upon the nature of the organizations and whether these are serving the interests of humanity and prepared to evolve as the UN and many other groups evolve and as humans evolve. Uh, for the record, uh, let me uh, just read uh, a sentence from Dr. Lewis Thomas. You probably know him as a fellow author and the scientist author chancellor of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Center. He states, we can build structures for human society never seen before, thoughts never thought before, music never heard before, provided we do not kill ourselves off, and provided we can connect ourselves by the affection and respect for which our genes are also coded. There is no end to what we might do on or off this planet. And the implication there, which I share, is that we have evolved because we have the capacity for love and cooperation and that we are not doomed uh, because uh, we manifest hate and uh, fear and greed uh, and uh, have succumbed in the past to iniquities like that. But by the very existence of the United Nations, we have an illustration of man's capacity for growth and shared um, goals. And uh, I think that uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the present does contain the future, and we, by acting energetically in the present, can affect our future and our survival. Therefore, I ask, uh, <clears throat> what is the answer to the question you raised about the, uh, <clears throat> uh, when one achieves peace within oneself, how will it affect the rest of humanity? given the time limits. What is the question, sir? The question was, when one achieves peace within oneself, how will it affect the rest of humanity ah, without organizational structures? I, I explained that. Forgive me, sir. Uh -huh. I explained it. <clears throat> to say, if I change, how will it affect mankind, the rest of the world? That's the question, isn't it, sir? Yes. Uh, Wait a minute, sir. That is the question. I think, if I may most respectfully point out, that's a wrong question. Change, and you will see what happens. Yeah. Sir, this is really very important thing. We have evade all the side, put aside all the side issues. Please do realize something tremendous that you are the rest of mankind psychologically. You are mankind. Whether you live in India, or Russia, China, or in America, or Europe. You are the rest of mankind, because you suffer, and everyone on this earth suffers in his own way. We share that suffering. It's not my suffering. So when you ask a question, what difference will it make if I or you change, it's a, if I may most humbly point out, it's a wrong question. You are avoiding the central issue. And we never seem to face the central issue, the central challenge, the demands that we live 
totally differently, not as Americans, Russians, Indians or Buddhists or Christians. I wonder if you have realised Christians have been responsible for killing human far more than any other religious group. Don't get angry, please. Then Islam, the Muslim world, then the Hindus and the Buddhists come much later. So if the so-called Christians, the Catholics included about 800 million people, if they said no more war, you will have peace on this earth. But they won't say that. It's only Buddhism and Hinduism said, don't kill. If you kill, they believe in reincarnation, you will pay in next life. Therefore, don't kill, don't kill. The least little thing, except what you have to eat, vegetables and so on. But don't kill. We're, we as Brahmins were brought up that way, not to kill a, a fly, not to kill animals for your food, but all that's gone. So please, we are suggesting that the central issue to stop wars, you must stop your own antagonisms, your own conflicts, your own misery and suffering. We have a written question here. Uh, uh, Mr. Krishnamurti, do you believe in the so-called realized soul? Do you believe in so-called realized souls? I don't know what it means. <laughs> yes, sir. Hello. Um, my name is Rohit. Sir, you're talking right now from a public forum, and once this lec you're talking right now from a public forum, and once this lecture is over, probably you'll return to a privacy that probably you cherish greatly. So there is, for most human beings in this world, a division between public life and private life. Could you co comment on this division? Do you feel it leads to conflict? Is it necessary? Between public life and private life? Yes. Is that the question? Yeah, thank you. Why do you separate this? Why do we separate public life as though something outside and private life. If one lived correctly, precisely, not intellectually, but holistically, then there is no outward life and private life. Holistically, that is to live as a whole human being, not as a sectarian, not as an individual, not as a petty little minds, brains, active with our self-interest. Sorry if I'm emphatic. Yes. Is that finished, sir? You... Is it finished? Uh, no. oh, I don't mind. I don't mind. If you are living peacefully, if you are living peacefully and the tyrant attacks, what do you not you, defend? What will you do then? Right. If you live peacefully and a tyrant or a robber attacks you, what will you do? That's the question. Do you live peacefully for a day or two, or you have lived peacefully all your life? If you have lived peacefully for many years, then you will do the right thing when you are attacked. <laughs> <coughs> yes, 
officers. <laughs> the speaker has been at this talking for the last 60 years and more. All over the world except behind the Iron Curtain. Before the war, he was all over Europe. And these questions have been put to the speaker for 60 years. The same pattern is being repeated by a young generation, by a civilization that is recent, like America. The same questions, with the same intention to trap this speaker or to really understand the speaker or to understand themselves. And when you have, if you have the misfortune or the fortune to have talked for 60 years, you will know all the answers and all the questions. There is no difference between question and answer. If you understand the question really deeply, the answer is in the question. <clears throat> Mr. Robert Miller would like to ask a question. Well, it is it is not to ask a question, it is just to congratulate you for your statement and to confirm that uh, having lived this organization for almost 40 years and having lived more than 60 years, I've come to the same conclusion as you. We are all being programmed. We are being programmed into a nation, into an ideology, into a religion. And all these are fragmented human beings. It took me 40 years to be in this house, to be deprogrammed from the two or three nationalities which were imposed on me. Each time at the, I got also a gun to shoot on the other direction. And it is here after having seen the world in its totality and humanity in its totality, that I have come to the conclusion that it is more important to be a human being than to be a Jew or a Catholic or a Frenchman or a Russian Quite or sure. a white and a black. Quite and in my book, I will not kill under any reason and for any nation or for any religion, or for any ideology. This is the conclusion which is also yours. Is it a conclusion, sir? It's... Or a actuality? That is my actuality. That's <laughs> not a conclusion. Ambassador Barish would like to comment. It's a question, question also. Uh, I'm sorry. It is, uh, as I am, uh, of course, I am not arguing about religions, but I, I will remind that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is not exactly a Christian precept. On the contrary, Christ thought the peaceful ways, care for your fellow human beings, have compassion and love, for one another. What I would like to know is, is how to break this pattern of confrontation am, among human beings. I'm not talking about states because human beings are, are formed by, uh, states are formed by human beings and governments too. They are human beings that rule the countries. How could we break this pattern? How is it that mankind has not been able to practice such loving thoughts as those uh, that Christ brought to us and that were brought also by other religions as Hinduism and Buddhism. I, I, I would like very much to see if we could find a formula, a solution to break that terrible pattern of confrontation and 
hate even between families, as uh, Mr. Krishnamurti has pointed out, because it's not just uh, war among nations. It's always that confrontation, rivality, uh, even among children. You see that if one is with mama, then the other one wants immediately and push the other one. That, that um, pattern, how could we break it? <laughs> Thank you. May I answer your question? Yes, Madam? I would love to. We are, we are programmed like computers. We are Catholics, Protestants, Buddhists, and so on. As Mr. Miller pointed out, we are conditioned. Do we realize or see actually, actually, not theoretically or ideologically, but actually see that we are programmed? Or is it just a casual statement? If you are actually programmed and you realize the consequences of being programmed, one of the consequences being hating or war or separ separating yourself from others. If one realizes that you are being programmed, pressurized, preached at, and if one really sees that, you abandon it, you don't want a formula for it. The moment you have a formula, you, then you are caught, like you, then you become programmed again, because you have your program and the other fellow brings you another program. So what is important is to realize the actuality of being programmed, not intellectually, with all your blood and energy. <clears throat> because of the time element, we may not be able to entertain any more questions. Uh, on behalf of the Pashimantari Society and the Movement for a Better World, we would like to thank our honored guest speaker and uh, Robert Miller and Ambassador Barish, who are the honorary presidents of the Society, and all of you who came to attend the lecture today. I have a very simple ceremony before you leave. Mr. Krishnamurti was here last year on the 17th of April, just around the time we had the Pashimantari Day. And this year, we were very fortunate to have on the 22nd anniversary of the Parchment Terrace, and you already heard about it. Uh, on behalf of the Parchment Terrace Society at the United Nations, we have the honor of presenting you, Mr. Krishnamurti, the world teacher with the United Nations 1984 Peace Medal.